Hey everyone, welcome back to the Kaderna Podcast, the show where we explore wealth in its original meaning, a state of well-being. I'm your host, Brian Kaderna, and today we have a very interesting guest in Christopher Volk. In the past, you might have heard me say that rich people work really hard to make lots of money, whereas wealthy people work really hard and their money makes lots of money. Chris fits the mold as he is what I would call a guru in raising capital and then compounding that capital. If you've heard the term OPM, or other people's money, today you're going to learn its real wealth building potential. Chris Volk has taken not one or two, but three companies public, two of those which he co-founded. The most recent is Store Capital, the ticker symbol is STOR on the New York Stock Exchange, where he served as the CEO. Most of his experience has revolved around real estate investment trusts, commonly referred to as REITs. Now in 2019, Chris won Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year Award. He's a frequent university lecturer, and most recently a visiting professor at Cornell University. In today's show, we're going to talk about his new book, The Value Equation, which reveals how to start and fund a business, and how to look at a business as an investor, whether it be a mom and pop or a giant like Tesla. So without further ado, here we go. Is going to require work and time and sweat and toil. If money wasn't an issue, what would I be doing? Don't worry about it. You'll figure it out. Change is the only constant. The Kadona Podcast. Chris, welcome to the show. Brian, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Certainly. Yeah, we're happy to have you on here. It sounds like quite a background that I think our listeners are really going to enjoy Can you just maybe as a starting point, tell us a little bit, how did you take your first company public? Because I know that's a dream for a lot of entrepreneurs. Sure. Well, we had been um, a private company for uh, a number of years. And and in fact, we were in the uh, the 80s. So we were in the real estate syndication business. We had a lot of different partnerships that had real estate in them um, that we were managing. And they were all net leased real estate assets chiefly fast food restaurants. So we had tons of fast food restaurants all over the country um, and 11 or 12 partnerships that had mostly fast food restaurants in them. And, and so we, uh, and today, by the way, they wouldn't have been partnerships, they'd be REITs, but uh, this is uh, some time ago. So we, um, uh, so in 1992, we, we embarked on a plan to take all of these things and merge them all together. And there were 140,000 uh, give or take investors and rolled all these, partnerships up into a publicly traded real estate investment trust, which was called Franchise Finance Corporation of America, and uh, proceeded to run that for uh, roughly seven years. And then in 2001, we sold it to GE Capital. So I became a GE Capital employee for uh, the better part of a year plus. Okay, interesting. How did you like that transition of going from kind of running the show to being a quote unquote employee? Um, I didn't like it very much to say the truth. <laughs> uh, and, and I realized that, that I just couldn't do that. I'd been associated with smaller businesses my whole life. And, um, and I was all of a sudden part of this company that had 350,000 employees. And, um, and you could feel the size of it just by being there. And, uh, and I longed to have a, um, a situation where I would be running a, a small company again. So the gentleman who was the principal founder for Franchise Finance. He and I started a second company uh, in 2003 and um, raised capital through Bank of America Securities and and, uh, later on took that company public on the New York Stock Exchange. And uh, that company today is still public. It's it's a company called Spirit Realty Capital, uh, symbol is SRC. And they moved the headquarters to Dallas, but uh, uh, the company was started by Morton myself. Okay. And was that similar as far as working in real estate and uh, building out a REIT, or was that a whole new venture for yourself? Uh, well, this this was another real estate investment trust. Basically, I've done three real estate investment trusts, and uh, they've been you know serial companies in a way. I mean, they they've had uh, similar strategies, but also different. I mean, it's evolved over time. Um, uh, store capital the store stands for single tenant operational real estate, and I came to the conclusion that profit center assets were kind of an asset class by themselves. So uh, restaurants weren't really an asset class by themselves, but if you throw them in together with veterinary clinics or fitness clubs or whatever, anything that makes money for people um, and, and use the, uses the real estate to sort of generate for wall profit. And it could even be uh, manufacturing facilities. Um, 
then then the the idea of having profits in our assets became an asset class to me. So uh, so that's how we started store. And um, I would say Spirit was kind of along those lines. It was, uh, uh, but they weren't all profit center assets. We had some data centers, we had some call centers. Um, those are important, but they're not profit centers. Okay. And now how did, how do you take that path? Like, I, I mean, I know there's a lot of folks out there that say they want to get into real estate or real estate development. You know, they get together, like you mentioned earlier, perhaps a partnership with, you know, five or six friends and start buying properties or buildings. Now you went a different route where I think you said the first company had, what was it? 125,000 investors in it. Yeah. We had 140,000 plus investors, Sam. 140,000. So how did, like, how did you get there? Was there always a, a fascination with real estate or was it a fascination with wealth and finding capital that kind of led into real estate? Um, it was really more or less a finance, uh, a, a interest in finance. So uh, when, if you have a restaurant franchisee, um, they have a choice whether they own the real estate or whether they rent it from somebody. And, uh, and this was in the eighties, uh, franchise finance was started. And, and the idea was that franchise finance would go off and, and be their landlord. It would buy the real estate. So they didn't have to buy the real estate and uh, they didn't have to show up with the money to get bank financing. And the bank financing was hard to get. And uh, so, so you're kind of bridging both real estate and finance. I mean, you're, you're definitely a piece of the capital stack of, of a company. And in fact, that's been really my approach um, for the last 30 plus years on, on, on doing uh, real estate finance. I've done mortgages and sale leasebacks, but it's always you're part of the capital stack. You're helping a company uh, basically form. You're an important part of the capital tools that uh, leaders have to create their company. And there are a lot of real estate intensive businesses out there. I mean, you're, you could be running uh, retail stores, uh, uh, movie theaters, uh, uh, convenience stores, uh, you know, restaurants, whatever. I mean, these are all um, enterprises that require vast amounts of real estate at, at quite substantial cost to be able to do. And uh, to have a landlord as opposed to a banker can can very oftentimes just be a better solution for people. And uh, and so we were there to provide that capital and you're and like I say, you're bridging real estate and finance. So I had kind of one foot in the real estate world and, and the other foot in the, in the finance world. And um, and I would say really mostly it was more finance than just real estate. And uh, so if you look at the left side of our balance sheet, you'd see piles of real estate. If you look at stores left side of their balance sheet today, you'll probably see 10, 11 billion dollars of the real estate. But um, uh, the reason they have that real estate is because they're providing a capital solution for the companies they serve. And maybe this is a little bit of a sidebar, but how do you feel about that today when we consider, you know, the world of Amazon, um, you know, the big malls and everything that just seem to be kind of shuttering their doors left and right as the world gets a little more remote and it's changing people working from home, maybe leaving the big city skyscraper for uh, working out of their house. Like, are you seeing a, a very big change in, in how people are doing, you know, large real estate investing? Um, well, absolutely. I mean, you have to have some vision towards the future of where you think things are going to be. Um, I mean, for me, one of the, one of the things that's, that's screaming at us right now is going to be things like driverless cars and, and, um, electric cars. And, uh, that could be 10 years off, but 10 years can come by in a flash of uh, <laughs> just a flash. And, uh, it's, so if you're in the real estate business and you're, um, uh, and the property you own is somehow dependent upon the internal combustion engine in some way um, uh, and uh, dependent upon people driving there. Uh, you have to really think twice about it um, and uh, because it, because the world's going to change on all of us. Um, uh, for the property types that we've had over the years, um, they've generally prospered through all the pandemic and through the changes. I would say that uh, anything that was a social gathering place during the pandemic. So you could talk about restaurants or fitness clubs or whatnot, uh, early child education. I mean, all these kinds of places got really hurt during the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. But they're all essential businesses. And they're all coming back uh, and, and have, have perhaps come back uh, completely. So um, so they're, they're doing fine and they'll, they'll be around. Um, um, most of the assets that store had were in more suburban type markets. Um, because you, you can't, um, if you're buying freestanding, fee simple real estate, you're not going to find a lot of it in Manhattan or uh, in, in densely populated areas on the East Coast or the West Coast. Um, uh, you're going to find it kind of in the Sun Belt and you're going to find it in the middle of America. 
Um, and, uh, and that's where most of the properties were that the store had. And, and they were in industries that are vital today as they were at the time we did them. So people need to go to veterinary clinics to get their pets checked out. So veterinary clinics own real estate store has lots of veterinary clinics. Um, and, uh, you know, people are going to go to restaurants. Is it, so all these places exist. And, and so part of it is to understand not just the company you're working with and the tenant you're working with, but do you feel good about the industry staying power and, and, and its relevancy? And, and we did. So, uh, and store today, I think has, uh, occupancy of like 99 and a half plus or something like that. So it's, it's, wow. you see really strong. Yeah, no, it sounds that way. And just to give our, our listeners an idea of kind of someone that's in a role such as yours, where you co-found a company, you build it up, you tape it, take it public, you know, you have all this capital to work with now and do all these ventures, but then you sell it. When you go into a position like that, are you thinking down the line, hey, I want to sell this and, and kind of cash out? Or was there a part of you at some point that said, hey, you know, I built this thing. I want to hold it forever and ever. Um, and maybe take it private again, or like, what are some of the thought processes that someone like yourself has going through those transitions? Well, I've always been, uh, I've always wanted to be a good custodian of shareholder capital. And, uh, and so you sell companies when you think it's in the best interest of shareholders first and foremost, but you also think that your employees and other stakeholders will benefit from it. Um, I mean, there are certain benefits that our employees had from being a part of GE. They could um, get transferred to other GE offices around the country. There were certain growth opportunities that they would have had in a larger company that they would not have had, perhaps in a smaller company. Um, uh, so, so in addition to our shareholders making money, our, our employees generally did pretty well um, out of the transaction. Um, uh, we concluded at the time that uh, our first public company just wasn't really getting the, the value it, it deserved. And um, and we didn't see a way that it was going to really get that value uh, anytime soon. And uh, GE had made an offer for it, and um, and our shareholders uh, did well by it, and so we uh, sold it. It was as simple as that. And uh, uh, it wasn't about me, and it wasn't about me wanting to stay as a CEO and, and have a company. I think you've got to be careful about people wanting to be entrenched in their jobs too much. Um, uh, I'm probably one of the few people alive that's actually sold to NYC companies um, uh, and because there's so much uh, there's there's uh, uh, so much to be said for for keeping that job. It's a pretty nice job to have be a CEO of a public trade company, uh, and yeah. not every CEO is going to be willing to walk away from that kind of stuff. So I walked away from it twice, um, and um, uh, the second company we sold we sold to an international consortium led by an Australian investment bank and. Um, uh, and our shareholders made a 19% compound rate of return. Um, uh, you know, the uh, uh, capital they were promising to provide us uh, seemed very enticing. So we um, uh, sold the company again, thinking that it was in the best interest of all the stakeholders. Um, and, uh, and then you have Store, and, and, and Store is on its second generation of leaders. And, um, you know, hopefully there'll be a third generation and a fourth generation. I think Store has some. Uh, ability to have some long-term staying power, and uh, uh, and as as the principal founder of the company, it's gratifying to see that. Yeah, no, that's great. And it sounds like it's all obviously worked out pretty well. And going back to like the the first go round, I know you said when you sold the GE, then you were technically an employee for a period of time of GE. Is that the norm when you've done that transition that they retain you or kind of keep you of counsel in a sense or? Um, or, you know, how do you feel like, are you hoping to kind of sell that and walk away? Or do you always want to be able to have a little input on what your former company is doing or becoming? Well, GE wanted us to stick around, but, um, uh, but GE had a much different business model than let's say a Berkshire Hathaway does. So Berkshire Hathaway has acquired a number of companies, but the leadership teams of those companies tend to stay in place with the exact same roles they had going into it. Um, mm -hmm. When GE would acquire companies, they would uh, assimilate those companies into GE in every form imaginable. So uh, your uh, IT platform would end up migrating to uh, uh, some other IT platform or your, uh, uh, your, your uh, employees would change. You'd have different people from human resources or uh, uh, people focusing on environmental risk. 
uh, that would uh, come into the company. So um, uh, GE liked to have you know, company leaders that were really familiar with GE's way of running businesses. And, um, uh, and GE had a very prescribed way of running businesses. And, uh, uh, and so I was not a management specialist. I was a, I, I was a, I was a specialist in finance. I really know finance cold, but uh, in terms of being a management generalist, uh, I was not. And uh, GE at the time was really run by management generalists. And um, so, uh, so I was not going to be the person that was going to be the chosen one to keep running uh, the company that I had been running. And, okay. uh, and, and as I realized that, and I like being able to, to run and develop companies, I, um, uh, departed GE uh, to start another one. Okay, interesting. And now just to, and I want to come back to the book because there's a lot in there. There's so much material that I found pretty eye-opening and really valuable, uh, no pun intended on the value equation. But before we go there, I always think it's good for people to kind of see some of the background and the genesis of, you know, what you started as before you got to today. And so can you take us through a little bit of, you know, maybe where you went to college and what happened from like, that point to then fast forward, you've got 140,000 investors in your first REIT that you're taking public. Like, how did you go from a, a college kid to taking that first company public? Sure. Well, I went to uh, Washington Lee University, which is a small um, college in, in Virginia, and I majored in European history and didn't take a single business class. And you're kidding. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm serious. Actually, I was a double major. I was a European history and French um, uh, dual major. And um, and I I will tell you, I have a weakness for liberal arts majors um, uh, and humanities majors because one thing that they get out of college is they they become pretty good at solving problems and dealing with abstractions and dealing with ambiguities, which the world is full of abstractions and ambiguities. And, uh, and they tend to write really well and they tend to have good powers of persuasion. And uh, and so much of that is really important and it carries you through the rest of it. I mean, I can teach anybody a lot about finance, but it's hard for me to teach them those kinds of soft skills. Um, and uh, so sometimes when I'm meeting finance majors, I'll suggest they go take a Shakespeare class or something. Um, uh, and uh, uh, because some of that could be really helpful uh, to them. Uh, a lot of times, especially in, in, in some of the universities I've been familiar with, the, the tests are all multiple choice and the, and the and finance can be so linear, you know, um, and the world is just not linear. The things that don't make sense, I mean, I could just go through chapter and verse of stuff that doesn't make sense, um, uh, both at our company and other people's companies. And um, uh, and so these are things you have to really get acclimated to as, as you're uh, looking to build a business and become a CEO and lead people. Um, so uh, when I got out of school, uh, and this is uh, uh, 1979, 1980, uh, at the time, there was not a lot of uh, demand for uh, European history and French double majors. So I, uh, my my first job right out of school was just selling clothes at, at a uh, men's store, and um, and I did that for uh, six months. I decided I was going to put myself through night school, so I started taking some accounting classes at night, and um, and I decided I wanted to work for a commercial bank because uh, I knew so little bit about so little about business. I figured if I could just be in a commercial bank and lend money to companies and um, that that would be great. I would learn a lot about what's out there. And, um, uh, and so that was my, my first choice and it was an important choice. And, and I ultimately got a job with a um, uh, sort of large regional commercial bank in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, stayed there for six years and became a credit geek. I uh, uh, learned how to read financial statements. I became a, uh, good at that. I mean, I, I did that for four years, lent money to companies for a couple of years and decided that I just didn't, you know, I liked finance a lot, but I didn't like banking. And, um, uh, and so I had, uh, I, you know, I could have probably gotten another job somewhere else and made more money at another bank. And I just, I turned out all that down. I went to work with a, uh, a gentleman in Phoenix, Arizona that I had banked and made no raise at all. Um, uh, but I went there because I liked his business model and I liked him and, and he hit, was involved in doing sale leasebacks on fast food restaurants and managing the money to do that. And uh, I just liked the niche a lot. And uh, uh, and I was willing to take the chance. I was 29 years old and I uh, took a chance on a small emerging company uh, in Arizona, a place I'd never been uh, and uh, uh, for any time anyway. And um, 
Uh, by that time, I got my MBA pretty much at night school at Georgia State um, and uh, proceeded to uh, start off in credit and, and work my way up. And, and ultimately, I went into him one day uh, and told him he should take all this stuff and combine it and put it into a real estate investment trust, and um, uh, which is what you do. And <clears throat> if you have good employees, they'll come up to you and say, this is what you should do. And you listen to him and he listened to me. And so I ended up being the guy that, that led all of that. And uh, so I um, directed it. Uh, it took two years to do it. It was very complicated and uh, ultimately uh, became president of the company on the board of directors. Wow. That's the rest is kind cool. of history. So. <laughs> That's awesome. And I guess kind of part and parcel to that, like how does one go about generating 140,000 investors to make it all possible? Because we need these other people's money, you know, to kind of uh, fuel the whole thing. Um, right. Did you have that market available or is that something where you guys were actually going out soliciting uh, investors? Um, so, right. So it's, it's interesting in terms of how capital is raised. Um, uh, some of the hardest money to raise, and you would know this from, from your business and from your, uh, the, the company, the people you work with, but uh, some of the hardest money to raise is uh, money in small dollars. I mean, when somebody wants to raise, a million dollars or two million dollars. I mean, that's that can yeah. be very, very difficult money to raise. Um, yeah, it's personal. Uh, yep. uh, sometimes when you're raising a hundred million dollars, it could be actually easier to raise a hundred million dollars. Um, uh, and uh, I mean, which is ironic, but it's just there. There are lots of companies out there that seem to have a hundred million dollars. Um, and so, what Mort had done was he had uh, uh, this idea to do sale leasebacks on fast food restaurants. And at the time, there were people raising private money. Uh, to do uh, lots of real estate type investing. And uh, and they're doing it through different houses. They're doing it through Merrill Lynch and uh, other people. And, and this was being sold to, pri- to you know, through brokers to accredited investors who uh, uh, met all the net worth and income tests to be able to buy uh, into illiquid uh, partnerships like this. And so uh, Mort's relationship uh, ended up being with uh, an investment bank called EF Hutton, which doesn't exist anymore. But at the time, they were a very prominent and, and very powerful bank. And, and so EF Hutton uh, was raising um, the, you know, the first the first year, they raised something like $25 million for us. Uh, then it was you know, $30 million and $50 million. And you know, at one point, they were raising two $300 million for us in a year, and um, uh, which at the time was a gargantuan sum of money. Uh, today, uh, this is still being done, but not quite the same way. So, and uh, but it's, it's you know, being capitalism and being free enterprise, it's being done in some very bigger uh, formats. So, uh, Blackstone uh, being the leader of the private real estate investment trust business today, uh, raising something on the order of two billion dollars a month. Um, and uh, but uh, it's all coming really through brokerage firms and through uh, um, accredited, you know, uh, smaller investors and. Uh, and so that's how that capital is being raised. And so over the years, I, as, a, as I'm starting companies and I'm raising capital, I had a tendency to go towards institutional investors into, uh, and, and dealing with large investment banks and, um, uh, and, and cultivating those kinds of relationships. Uh, and so I became pretty good at raising large sums of money. Uh, and, but if you ask me to go start a business with somebody tomorrow and raise small sums of money, I probably... Uh, be uh, working hard to get that done. So, um, uh, so, our, so our, our customers were not family offices. Our customers, our, our investors were really um, uh, the, the investment banks that would uh, generate that uh, those dollars coming in, and uh, uh, and that's how we did it. Okay. So, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you kind of strayed away from venture capital or traditional banking and lending, and went straight to these large investment houses to get their money. Yeah, so I mean, as, as you're running a public company, when we took when we took our first company public, we had roughly a billion dollars in equity and no debt. Um, and uh, uh, so, one of the cool things about our first business was that we were paying out uh, high single digit, low double digit uh, annual returns to investors uh, with no with no debt at all to do it. I mean, it was completely unlevered. Um, uh, today, with rates being as low as they are, you couldn't begin to accomplish that. Um, but uh, this is this is a different different time and place. And um, uh, when we when we took the company public, uh, then we started borrowing money. And so uh, if you look at store today, store is forty percent levered, um, and uh, store is an investment grade company. It's a triple B rating, um, 
going on triple D plus and, um, uh, and it and it, is, it can issue debt. It also has its own conduit where it can issue AAA debt, um, and so it's got about a third of its assets are encumbered uh, with with that conduit, and then the other two thirds are unencumbered. And um, uh, so, so you're kind of doing a mix of equity and debt, but really it's mostly equity. I mean, forty percent levered in real estate is not much. So, uh, when when someone's investing in a REIT like store, there's not a lot of risk to it because there's just not a lot of debt on these companies. And how does it just to give us an idea as things kind of change rapidly, like right now, where you're seeing, you know, the Fed's going to raise interest rates kind of steadily throughout the year, a lot of volatility, a lot of things going on. How does that affect that business and how you go about some of your raising capital or lending? Um, as the, is, are, is that something that like you or your team would have their finger on the pulse of interest rates and what are we going to do next? Well, you always try to keep abreast of it. Um, uh, you probably notice as you're looking at the marketplace that the market responds uh, to moves in interest rates or to the notion that we're concerned interest rates are going to move. And, uh, and so you've seen the market have a pretty si- sizable uh, reversal in the last number of months based upon rates both going up and also the fear that rates are going up even further. Um, uh, and, and when you get dividend intensive stocks like REITs, for example, they can actually be more susceptible to this uh, because they're viewed as kind of a fixed income replacement in some respects. Um, and so people are assuming that the uh, dividend is going to be worth less in the future because uh, rates are going to be higher or there's going to be inflation or something like that. Um, but then what's what's interesting is that if rates will stabilize, let's say let's say the 10 year hypothetically goes to three and a half and just stays there, um, mm-hmm. uh, then my experience is that all these stocks are gonna bounce back um, because now people have more certainty, they have more clarity. What, what investors really hate is uncertainty and, and businesses don't like uncertainty either. So, uh, so you, you have a whole pile of people that just don't like uncertainty. And right now we've got a, a fair amount of uncertainty. And, and uh, uh, But if at some point in time it becomes clear that the economy's uh, gonna grow at a reasonable pace and, and inflation is gonna be reasonably contained and the 10 year is gonna stay at three or three and a half, then, um, uh, then you look at a company like Store that's paying out almost a 6% dividend yield today against a 3% treasury or something. And you say, well, that's a heck of a deal. you know. Um, and so people start jumping back into these stocks and driving their prices up. And that's, that's what's likely to happen in my view. Yeah. And now when you were at the helm of like these type of companies and expanding through real estate, would like traditionally, like how you know Buffett would talk about with Berkshire Hathaway in the stock market, you know, that you want to get greedy when others are fearful and the time of uncertainty is like the time to expand. Did you take a similar outlook? Is that when you got really busy and felt like you could make up a lot of ground in times such as these? Well, the answer is yes and no, because when the market is, um, when the market is turbulent, uh, then oftentimes what will happen is if you're a public company and if you're a REIT, your stock is getting hit. Uh, and if your stock's getting hit, it becomes harder for you to raise capital. And REITs have to pay out 90% of their taxable earnings. That's, that's the cost of being a REIT, which basically means that unlike Berkshire Hathaway, which pays out no dividends, they can't just reinvest all their cash into growth and compound the growth. They have to um, uh, pay out 90% of their taxable income in, in dividends. And to be able to grow the way store has been growing, uh, they have to go out constantly and raise new capital. But if you get into a situation like 2008, 2009, where you get into a situation like the beginning of the pandemic, where things really uh, fall apart in 2020, um, then those kinds of companies actually have a hard time raising capital, which which uh, uh, if you're leading a company like I've been leading companies like that, you're you're kind of pinching yourself because you know that if you had all the money out there, you could make some some tremendous investments. And um, and this is always true. I mean, when the market's falling apart, that's where you make the best investments. And uh, and by the way, if you have uh, a recession, for example, um, uh, some of the very best bank loans are made during recessions because you're uh, making Loans when interest rates are higher, perhaps capital is uh, a little more scarce, company values get depressed, uh, and all of a sudden you can make some just amazing loans. It's uh, it's the loans that are made at the top of the market or the investments that are made at the top of the market, which have the highest risk oftentimes. So you're saying that's interesting. I think a lot of people would find that counterintuitive, but you said like in the midst of a recession or an environment like you described, 
that's where a bank would be more apt to say, hey, let's let's go out and make some loans. Like this is our time. Uh, yeah, that's that's what I would be doing. I mean, if I'm if I'm somebody who's got a lot of money, yes. I mean, um, uh, if you were in 2008, 2009, I could have um, taken a bunch of real estate listings and thrown darts on the wall, and probably most of them would have done pretty well, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, so there's a time where you can almost be indiscriminate, you know, um, and and still make some money. But then there, you know, um, the last few years are not those kinds of times. It's been very frothy. There's been a lot of money chasing uh, product. Um, you know, we have not had inflation in the United States for a long time. But what we have had is asset inflation. And uh, so anybody who's been trying to buy a house or anything else has, has seen uh, the prices of assets go way up. And, and that's been assisted in large part by the fact that interest rates have been so low and and, uh, uh, and it's caused the ad- prices of assets, whether they're houses or stocks, for that matter, to, to, to go up. And I find asset inflation to be uh, about as pernicious as uh, monetary inflation. Uh, I mean, there are people that get hurt with, with asset inflation. Um, certainly, if you're a fixed income investor, there's nothing you can do. So you got to buy uh, stocks. You're taking higher levels of risk. Um, I think that if you're looking at income inequality or, or uh, net worth inequality, I think it gets um, promoted more when you have asset bubbles than when you don't. Um, so I, I, I think that you know the sort of the perfect market, the stasis market, is where you have kind of low monetary inflation and you have uh, assets that are not rising as much as they have been in the last few years. Yeah, no, I think that's a good summary of the markets and. Frothy is that word you keep hearing where, I mean, you just pump trillions of dollars into the economy, put interest rates at rock bottom, and there's just so money floating around that's going to go into these assets and, and prop them up. Um, so now, yeah, who knows what we'll see in, in the rest of this year, this kind of correction as things perhaps normalize and the rates go up, but I guess only time will tell. <laughs> uh, yeah, well- I mean, I just say, you know, I mean, for a person who lived through my, you know, through the um, uh, early '80s and the late '70s, um, you know, when I was when I started working, uh, the prime interest rate was 21 percent, and uh, and Paul Volcker was trying to 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 squeeze the economy and squeeze inflation out of the out of the economy, and um, today it's almost inconceivable to think about the interest rates being that high. I mean, I think the 10 year got to be north of 10 percent or something. Uh, my my home mortgage was in the neighborhood of 10 percent or 9 percent. Um, and uh, uh, so, you know, housing prices were cheap. People couldn't afford anything. In my entire working career, um, the interest rates had basically just slid downward um, uh, to the point where you're you were seeing, you know, one percent, one and a half percent ten-year treasuries. Uh, and now we're we're ticking back up. And the average ten-year treasury, by the way, is somewhere in the neighborhood of four, four and a half percent. I'm not sure that that the U.S. would do really well on a four, four and a half percent ten-year treasury because it would raise mortgage rates a lot and uh, probably hurt the housing market. So I think that they're going to try to uh, strike a balance where you get into a ten-year treasury that's kind of in a uh, three-handle type range, a three, three and a half. Yeah, that does seem to be kind of the comfort level, and I think the Fed would be very happy if they could pump the brakes there and have inflation kind of come back and check. But uh, we'll see. A lot of factors at play. And speaking yeah. of those factors, I know in, in your book, again, which is called The Value Equation, it, it's based a lot on this business model or this formula that includes six variables, some of which we've touched on a little bit. But you mentioned that they include sales, business investment, operating profit margin, the amount of interest costing proceeds or other people's money, and then the cost of other people's money, and then the annual maintenance capital expense. So there's a lot there. I'm sure some of maybe a new listener or a novice in credit might not understand all of that. Can you walk us through like how you approach those variables and what they mean uh, to a business owner or to an investor? Okay. Um, I'll do the best I can and I'm going to try to keep it (laughs) basic. Sure. Um, The the value equation came about because over the years, I've just been modeling companies out um, and I've modeled out as Asian businesses. And um, and the goal was to try to take the business model and reduce it to as few variables as you can get. Um, and then basically throw away the spreadsheet um, and create a financial model that's universal. Um, and so that's what the value equation is. And, and the value equation computes uh, what's called a current uh, pre-tax return on equity or return on, on shareholder uh, investment. And uh, it's not the total return. It's just the current 
pre-tax return on equity, how much cash flow is coming back at you uh, and dividing that into the amount of equity investment that you or other people have made in the business. Um, and from that number, you can do everything. You can start to calculate total rates of return that are expected. You can start to uh, calculate uh, um, you know, business values pretty easily. Um, I mean, there's a whole host of things you can do with that simple uh, understanding. Um, and of course, if you have companies that are not making money yet, and there are plenty of companies that start off and they're not making money, um, then what you're really having to do is sort of understand what the business model is two or three years hence from now uh, and calculate where it's going to be. Because at the end of the day, uh, companies that don't make money aren't going to be worth anything. So you have to have a company that has a business model that's viable as, and, and has expectations for generating current equity returns. And, um, uh, and so that's what the V formula does. It calculates or the value equation calculates um, uh, current equity returns, and it does it with six variables that are universal. Um, it's a financial formula. It's not an accounting formula. Um, uh, you know, finance is sort of like a universal language. It's like music, uh, whereas accounting is not a universal language. It's a manufactured language. Um, and uh, uh, so you want to sort of uh, focus on the pure finance of it. And, and that's how entrepreneurs think. They understand how much cash they got in the bank. They understand what their cash flow is. Um, and so you want to get it down to that kind of level. Um, uh, the variables in the equation, some of them are super intuitive, sales of sales, uh, and, and uh, you know, all companies start with sales. If you don't have sales, you, you're, you're not going to have a company. So, uh, but business investment is not intuitive. Um, uh, you know, business investment is basically anything that you got to fund with other people's money, and other people's money could be borrowings or it could be money from a company like Store Capital that I ran, uh, where somebody's, some landlord's giving you money. Uh, or putting up money so you can have a veterinary clinic or whatever. So, um, so OPM is OPM, and it could be borrowed OPM, released OPM, um, and uh, uh, and and when you're calculating, uh, since it's since it's the investments that's made with other people's money or shareholder equity, there's some things that just don't cost you anything. I mean, for example, uh, if you have trade creditors that you you buy merchandise from, you, you're running a restaurant, you buy your food inventory. Um, you get maybe 30 day terms on that and it's, and it doesn't cost you anything. I mean, um, and what's interesting about that is your inventory in the, in the restaurant business probably turns over three times, you know, three, three, every three days it turns over. So over 30 days, you could turn it over 10 times, um, which means that you're paying for your inventory, you know, why you flipped over other inventory 10 times. So you get that free use of money. Yeah. You're and of the game. So, so if you, if you're getting free use of money from, uh, deposits, trade payables, and it's, it's something like that that doesn't cost you anything, then that's really, from an entrepreneur's perspective, that's a deduction from business investment. You know, it's not a liability. It's just something I don't have to pay for, you know. Um, so when I'm thinking about the capital stack, uh, it's a deduction from from the business investment. Um, uh, there's a story in there about uh, Damon John, who's a pretty well-known guy on Shark Tank as a judge and uh, created an apparel company. And uh, and a story that he recounted to me at, at a conference that we had where he literally almost went out of business um, uh, because he was sitting on piles of orders to start the company. But uh, he didn't realize that when he was uh, selling merchandise and he had 30 day terms, I think he gave his, uh, his customers 60 days to pay him. That basically what he was doing was swapping out inventory for a 60 day loan. Right. So he was shifting his investment from investments in fabric and merchandise uh, into an investment in a 60 day loan to somebody. And that's an investment. It's a business investment. Um, and, uh, and he wasn't funded to be able to have a business investment for 60 days. And so he almost ran out of cash, you know, and this, and this is why businesses fail. It's not because they lose money. It's because they run out of cash. Um, and uh, uh, so, you know, when I listened to his story, I was thinking, okay, this is a man who almost went out of business because he didn't understand what business investment was. Um, and so uh, business investment is a, uh, a chapter is devoted to that and it's um, uh, early on. So um, uh, the the amount of OPM is is uh, pretty intuitive because it's sales and, and, and uh, there could be sale lease backs or you know, lease money or it could be uh, borrowings from banks. Uh, or borrowings from family members or other people. Uh, the cost of other people's money is pretty basic. Uh, that's intuitive. Operating profit margin is a cash number. So it's a, the percentage you're making uh, before taxes. And it, it uh, uh, and, and I tend to, if, if I'm, if I'm renting properties, like for example, if I, uh, at store capital, if we were 
providing capital to a restaurant operator for their restaurants. Um, uh, in, in the accounting parlance, people think about operating profit margin as EBITDA, earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, amortization. Um, I tend to think of it as EBITDA, uh, so I include the rent in that because uh, somebody could own the restaurant or just rent it from us. And, and, uh, uh, and so either way, it's a cost of OPM. So if you're trying to factor an OPM, I sort of back out the, the rent uh, number from that. I take away all the uh, non-cash stuff, and there's plenty of non-cash stuff these days. Um, uh, if, by the way, if you're looking at a financial statement, uh, the accountants are just – they can't get – they can't help themselves. So there's non-cash stuff everywhere. So you have um, – uh, things called right to use on leases, which are total non-cash and made up. Uh, in our company, we had straight line rents, non-cash, it's made up. So um, uh, so when you're trying to think about how much companies really cost to build, and you're looking at their financial statements, and you're thinking about what is business investment, uh, you have to make sure you kind of undo some of the, the, the um, accounting that's been done uh, to obscure the finance. Um, and then, um, and then you're dealing with maintenance capex is the last variable. And maintenance capex would sound pretty simple. I mean, you're running a restaurant and you you got to replace French fryers every year and that kind of stuff. But um, uh, but it's there's more to it than that. Um, for example, a company like Walmart uh, has grown uh, over the years, and in the process of growing over the years, they've actually closed down a bunch of stores. I mean, they've closed down Walmart's and relocated them. They've closed down a pile of Sam's Clubs. They've closed down. Uh, neighborhood food markets. They've gotten out of certain uh, uh, market countries around the world. And when that happens, it's, uh, uh, you know, where does that show up on your financial statement? I mean, uh, uh, well, the loss on uh, uh, investments uh, should show up somewhere. And, and so I, I tend to throw it in the maintenance capex expense with the, um, or let's say you, you have a hotel that you, that you own. Um, and every five years or every year you, you, you replace carpet or whatever, but every five years you might do a whole facelift. And sometimes uh, people who are running businesses, uh, they're thinking about what's going to happen from CapEx from year to year, but they don't think about the every five year thing. You know? um, uh, so when you're calculating this and you're, you're thinking about the viability of your business, you have to include things like losses on the, on the closure of properties or the uh, losses on occasional failures. And you've got to think about um, uh, what's happening to your business every five years as you're replacing it and, and making it look better because you have to keep the business up to be able to attract customers. Otherwise, you're going to lose market share. Um, and, uh, uh, and so those are the six variables. And when you string them all together, you're going to come up with a current equity return. And the goal, by the way, is to have a company that's worth more than a cost to create, which sounds, sounds pretty intuitive. But the thing is that most businesses in the world don't rise to that level. Um, most businesses in America are kind of vehicles for people to create jobs, work for themselves, which there's nothing wrong with. But the people that are in the Forbes 400 and the people that are in the uh, uh, top echelons of wealth in the world virtually all made their money in business um, without exception. And, um, and all of them created companies that were worth more than they cost to create. And they did so by generating returns that were, were high and they were more than what people wanted to make. And, uh, and so uh, the V formula is, or the value equation is, is the essence for how that is done. And, um, and therefore it's a barometer of how you can create wealth and uh, gain entry into the top 1%. That's no, that was great. I think that's a good summary. I know there's a lot of information there. People might have to rewind real quick for five minutes and re-listen to that, but that was very valuable. And I think a good way to kind of think about valuing a business. Now, a follow-up question I have to that is everything you just kind of described sounds very numerical. Where does emotion play a role in some of the, these decisions? And, and when I think of that, I look at oftentimes, like, let's say a value company versus a growth company. And if we rewind, you know, 10 years, 15 years ago, and you look at a Macy's or a McDonald's or one of these where they've had, you know, a long record of cash flow, they have a gigantic balance sheet of assets and real estate. And then you look at something like an Amazon or a Tesla or a lot of the tech sector seems to kind of be disconnected from some of just simple math and where they just, we've seen their companies explode where uh, it kind of started with so much of just like what felt like an idea. Um, how do you fit that in where something is not so tangible as maybe real estate or just a classic company? 
Yeah, well, there's a chapter on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in the value <laughs> equation. And, uh, and it was because, sort of like how you asked the question, I figured that at some point some reader was going to like get to it, get through this and say, well, this all sounds pretty orderly. Uh, this is how businesses are valued. And this is how, you know, this is how you capitalize. This is how you create wealth. Um, but then why is it that uh, Tesla had a stock price that kept going up for 10 years while it had negative operating profits, you know? Um, and, exactly. uh, uh, and, 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 uh, and that's a heck of a thing. So you go, okay, well, how, how is that? So, um, and I decided that public companies and private companies sometimes operate under different rules. Um, and um, uh, when you have a charismatic leader like an Elon Musk uh, creating a, a compelling product, uh, the, the Tesla car is certainly a compelling product, uh, sometimes um, uh, emotion just uh, takes over and people buy the stock. And if you ask somebody, what's the business model you know, for Tesla? What are the six variables for Tesla? Um, uh, uh, nobody could probably still tell you exactly what those six variables are. I mean, they just don't know. I mean, uh, so you're buying into a company where the business model really hasn't yet been proven. Um, uh, and, uh, and no one really knows exactly what it is. I mean, they know he's selling a lot of cars and, and he's uh, gaining market share, but they don't really know exactly what the business model is. Um, and, uh, and the company's certainly not telling you exactly what the business model is. Um, and, and, uh, and at the end of the day, the business models are all that matters. I mean, uh, so what will happen to Tesla, like with every other company, is it's going to end up with a valuation that will be reflective of its business model. But that's not the case today. And, and, uh, uh, and, and you see this in the tech sector, especially where, um, uh, where there's a certain amount of euphoria. Uh, and the, the economist I quote is, is John Maynard Keynes, who early on came out with this thought called animal spirits where uh, uh, people just kind of get excited. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and that's happened throughout human history. I mean, uh, it, it, whether it's the tulip bulbs in, in, uh, uh, in Holland or, uh, or, or inflated uh, NASDAQ markets in the late, 90, late 90s, um, uh, this just happens. And now with the rest of America, and by the way, there are only like 4,000 public companies, um, of which of those 4,000 companies, only a handful that would fall into the kinds of categories we're talking about where there's that much of uh, animal spirit uh, influence. But uh, uh, for the rest of America, uh, the average uh, guy building a business doesn't have that choice. He better have you know a positive operating margin because if he doesn't have a positive operating margin, he can't borrow money and he can't pay his, pay his employees and he can't raise money all the time uh, from stockholders willing to let him operate at a loss. Um, and, uh, and so most of America runs as a, as a value company, basically. I mean, uh, they're, they're running on, on business fundamentals that are embodied in the value equation. And, um, and the companies that uh, manage to sort of uh, skate by without really adhering to the value equation fundamentals those companies eventually will be get you know caught up in value equation fundamentals. It's just a matter of time. And so so uh, you could have it could be them, it could be Carvana, it could be any of the companies that have had you know huge inflation and their stock prices have gone up uh, while they're not making any money at the time. And uh, but eventually their their shares will always be a function of what the business model will bear. So there, you're kind of saying there are some outliers, and I like that the way you pointed out the animal spirit where it can kind of make uh the irrational i guess kind of feel rational sometimes yeah no i mean uh uh you know it, with uh with amazon i'm not sure amazon makes any money i mean when you look at their financial statements um uh their fulfillment costs are enormous uh, if i uh you know if i buy uh, a jar of olives i can have some guy occasionally show up at my house in a prius dropping them off <laughs> and i'm not i'm not and I'm wondering, well, how do you make money doing that so um uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Amazon Web Services, AWS makes a ton of money, uh, but, but Amazon and as, a, um, uh, as a merchandiser, um, uh, that's the question is, you know, what is their return on equity? What is their business model? Um, and years ago, I would ask my, my friends uh, well, who were Amazon investors, well, um, you know, I'd say, well, what's their business model? They don't seem to make any money. And they'd say, well, you know, they're just investing back into the business. They're putting all their money back into the business, but they could make money if they wanted to. And I would say, well, how much? 
<laughs> and and nobody knows, right? So uh, so so you get into this thought process, and this is true with a lot of growth stocks where people um, don't really know exactly what it is. And and then you have companies, by the way, uh, one of the companies that's illustrated in the book is is Google slash Alphabet, which was almost a value company from the day it started. I mean, it it raised capital um, uh, and never really invested. I mean, it had. It raised, I think, a billion and a half to $2 billion in its IPO, um, and it just went on the balance sheet because they already had $500 million bucks in cash when they went public, and they didn't really need the money. And and today, they have just gobs and gobs of cash, and they've been building it the whole time. I mean, uh, uh, so uh, there's a company that had like an actual business model. Uh, it was an exciting company, but did have it. So you have sort of a mix in the tech space of you know real companies with serious business models, and then you have companies... Um, uh, where the business models are not yet shown. That's it's interesting. There's so many things that uh, you know I could spend some time on there that we could really dive into, um, and that's I think why business is so fascinating because it's like there's more one more than one way to skin the cat and more one way to stay alive uh, as you're going. One of the last questions that I had for you here that I think you touch on a little bit in the book that's really appealing, especially for a small business, is essentially like how do you get that investor to part with their money. I know you said a little bit a few moments ago, it's almost harder to get a million dollars than a hundred million. Do you look at the value equation? Do you encourage a entrepreneur or a small business to run their own business kind of through that equation and use that as the selling point to investors? Or can you give us a little glimpse of what that looks like or how you've been successful doing that? Right. So, so the, at the heart of the book, the book is about how the richest people got rich, you know, um, and when, when, we, when you look at books and you talk about um, uh, when, when there, there are a lot of books on how people get rich and they usually, usually uh, focus on um, improving people's personal habits, uh, staying out of debt, uh, investing money uh, uh, and uh having your money work for you and not you work for the money and, and so on, which is all true. Um, but the richest people in, in history made their money by, by not just buying stocks. They made their money by investing in their own businesses and, and creating those businesses. Um, and I'm a, just a big believer in the free enterprise system. And I'm a big believer in the virtues of business and, uh, and uh, wanted to create a book that would show people how wealth is created, you know, and, uh, uh, and so, and the and the key to creating uh, large wealth is to generate have have a decent business model. You start off with an idea, and you create a business model, and then um, uh, and then focus on how you get that business model to deliver shareholder returns. And if the the returns are more than shareholders need to get, um, if they're willing to like have a lower return than you can actually generate, then you can create lots and lots of wealth you can create it from just thin air um and uh and you can create it over a fairly short period of time i mean you look at some of the people you're talking about like elon musk or whatever who's created uh become the the richest guy in the world over the span of a decade you know i mean uh which is pretty incredible i mean uh, so um whereas uh if you're thinking about frugal uh investing and uh, setting aside seven percent of your income every year and putting it into a, the market and trying to generate seven percent returns I mean, you can create wealth doing that and be, be personally wealthy, but it takes a long period of time and a huge amount of discipline to be able to do that. Um, uh, and a lot of business people just chose a different path, you know, and uh, and and did things that uh, they took perhaps some risks as well. But they, they did some things that uh, allowed them to create wealth from thin air and do it in a fairly short period of time, which, which is what businesses can do. Um, and to raise money from investors, which is getting to your question, you have to be able to have a business that can produce uh, returns that are um, uh, bigger than people would want to have. And, uh, and, uh, and so if you're raising money for a small company, typically what you might do would be to, uh, first of all, uh, it's sort of like being on Shark Tank. You know, when you're, when, you're, when you're out there trying to raise capital from Shark Tank, the people doing it are always trying to part with the least amount of their company they can. So they're trying to sell 10% of their company or 15% of their company for some relatively high number uh, and convince the sharks to do it. And there's always sort of the back and forth in that. Uh, but 
that's so the first thing you're doing is you're selling off part of your company as a small part uh, and trying to convince people that it's really worth far more than you have in it. And oftentimes entrepreneurs have no money. I mean, you, I mean, you think about Sergey Brin and Larry Page who started Google, they were doctoral students. I mean, at Stanford, I mean, how much money could they have? They probably have almost zero money in that company, but today they control 51% of the voting interest in the, in the stock uh, and have substantial holdings and they're, and they're in the top five or 10 richest people in the, in the world. <laughs> so, um, uh, and so this is, you know, you can raise capital. You don't have to be those guys, by the way, you can raise capital in much, much less interesting businesses, uh, <laughs> but they have to generate uh, reasonable returns. And oftentimes you have to sort of, you know, uh, subordinate your returns to, to investors. So you have to promise investors that uh, you don't get any money out of it unless they get an 8% return or something like that. And there's some examples in the book about how that gets done. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and if you can part with a little bit of the business um, and, and give investors a, a guaranteed rate of return um, uh, or preferred rate of return and, and also uh, show them how, they, how they're going to be able to get out of the business, because a lot of investors don't want to just stay in. They want to know what the exit is. Um, then you have a chance to raise some money. Um, and, uh, and by the way, this is a country of small business. I mean, more than half Americans uh, work for, for small companies. And uh, there's not another country like America in that respect. And we have probably 10,000 companies out there that are private equity or venture capital companies, which when I started my career, there were zero. Um, uh, so there are 10,000 of these companies. And, um, uh, and if you have a good idea and a good management team and, um, uh, and the makings of a decent business model, uh, it, that's harder to do than to actually be able to raise money. I mean, uh, there's there are lots of avenues for people to raise capital if people are just persistent enough to do it. Yeah, that's almost what I was thinking as you were speaking. It's like in your book, you almost have a manual of sorts here of how to go get money. But it's like, all right, well, before we go get money, we have to have an incredible idea that is better than the next guys, you know, that can produce that sort of uh, profit and give those returns to their investors. Um, so it's funny as I'm yeah, thinking that yeah. I'm like, all right, so there's a way to do this, but I'm like, where's the, yeah, idea? But it doesn't, like, what are the but great it ideas? Doesn't, <laughs> yeah. And, and it doesn't have to be as incredible as all that, you know? So, um, I, you know, I like looking at the force 400 list because the people on that list tend to run some companies that have some of the best business models going in any given generation. Um, but, uh, you know, you can make, you can do really super well in, uh, old world businesses that are far less exciting. I mean, you could be uh, having auto repair shops, restaurants. I mean, uh, um, a whole host of uh, businesses out there where uh, people can really generate some pretty substantial wealth uh, without being in the tech space or doing something that's super asset light. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, you look at the top guys in the, in the world, they tend to be sort of in tech uh, asset light businesses. Um, uh, about 25%, by the way, about 25% of the Forbes 400 are in asset management, you know, so they're in finance. They're kind of like the um, Apollos, Blackstones, Colbert, Kravis, Roberts, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Carlisle's. I mean, that's that's 25% of the Forbes 400. So they, that, that kind of group dominates today, the, the asset management group. Um, uh, but those are the guys, the asset management group, you know, if you go way down and say, well, there are 10,000 of these asset management companies, and no wonder there are 10,000 of them because it's a pretty good business model. Um, uh, that's, that's, in a way, pretty good for capital formation because if people are wanting to get money today, there are 10,000 of these companies you can find. So uh, all, all ranging from making big investments to making much smaller investments. Yeah, that's a lot of interesting stuff here. I think a lot of people are going to have to take a, a deep dive into this book. And what's next for you? I know you've had a nice career here uh, with these three companies. You know, what, how, what's the encore, I guess? You know, I haven't really decided yet. I, I, I took time out to do this. I um, just finished up a class at Cornell University where I've been a visiting professor. I, um, uh, you know, I'm going to take my time with this book and, and uh, uh, try to get the word out. Um, uh, it's probably the only book written on how businesses create wealth. And, um, uh, and, and so, uh, uh, so I'm excited to have been able to do that. And I, I hope that it gets some traction because I think it, it can help some people. Um, and then uh, uh, beyond that, uh, I'm going to sort of uh, look at opportunities I have uh, at the end of this year, beginning of next year. It's going to be probably sort of a two-year process. This is the first time in my entire career where I've actually 
uh, I stepped back and um, uh, and uh, and decided that I want to try a few different things and and uh, and see what happens. And uh, I've got some ideas for another business, but um, I may or may not do that yet. I mean, so um, so right now I'm just having a good time. So I'm, I'm enjoying That's enjoying awesome. the book, enjoying my family, and travel, and, and uh, uh, being on some boards and. Uh, and uh, that's that's been Good great. That's awesome. And so, in closing, I know one of the favorite segments of the show for our uh, our listeners is what we call the lightning round, where I could just fire off some quick questions here, and you tell us the first thing that comes to mind, just to get you get to know you a little bit better as a guest on the show. Um, so, are you okay with that? Uh, <laughs> I'll do the best I can. You're going to ask me <laughs> lightning questions, ask. and my, my mind doesn't always work as fast as lightning questions, but okay, well, I'll do my best. Uh, that's when we get the best responses. <laughs> all right, so here we go. What would you say is your favorite book of all time? Oh, my favorite book of all time. Um, you know, I guess, uh, you know, my favorite book I've read is probably East of Eden by John Steinbeck. Um, uh, it's uh, yeah. So there you go. What was the title? I know. Uh, East, of e- East, East of Eden. East of Eden. Okay. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And uh, favorite movie? Uh, favorite movie. Uh, well, my wife's favorite movie is Overboard with Goldie Hawn and Kirk Russell because it has no meaning, no morals, no message, uh, and and it has a happy <laughs> ending. So that's kind of uh, for rule all movies. Okay. All right. That's a good one. And what would you say is the biggest failure you've had in your career? The biggest what? Failure. Failure. Biggest my mistake. Yep. Um, yeah. So the biggest mistake probably goes back to the late eighties and, um, uh, and I won't get into some details on it, but what we did was we shifted our business. Um, and, uh, because we lost, we became uh, uh, impatient. And, um, and what we did was we jettisoned a core competency. Um, uh, so we had a, a group of people that was pretty good at raising money and we jettisoned them. And, um, and if we'd been more patient and, um, and stuck with it longer and muddled through, um, that would have paid off. And I think when, when you're thinking about one of the things that business people really have to think about is what are they really good at? What's their, what, and what are, were their companies really good at? You know, what's, you know, what makes their companies, what they are and the essence of them and, and those are what we call core competencies. And when people jettison them, you just got to be careful about doing that. And we jettisoned the one core competency and it costs us. Yeah, man. Well, you, you live and learn. And on the flip side of that, can you point to maybe what was the biggest success or breakthrough that you had? Um, well, the biggest success I had was doing store capital. And, uh, but it, took me to do two prior companies to be able to pull it off. So, uh, and basically I raised uh, in the span of um, three or four months, I raised more than half a billion dollars to start store capital with no, you know, which is a real estate investment company. I had no assets, uh, no assets that were even targeted. I mean, I just had an idea. And, um, but based upon the track record of the two prior companies that I had uh, was able to convince people to do that. And, um, uh, and then over this over the course of three years, raised over a billion dollars to uh, start store on its way through private investors, and um, I think that would be the biggest success. That's awesome. And people must think you have quite a rolodex just to be able to say, "All right, we don't have any assets yet, but boom, I'm going to go out and raise half a billion dollars, you know, quickly in a short period of time." Is it kind of like that? Is it you know you just have like the five guys you know you need to call that that can bank on you? Um. Well, it's probably a few more than five, but yeah, I mean, I mean, you're, you're going through, yeah. through the Rolodex and you're, and you're going through people, you know, so, so yes, I mean, uh, and very much people who I've met over my career have been important players in, in helping us start and, and be successful in the businesses that we've run. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, try, try, if you're trying to start real estate is always a physical asset. So when you're trying to convince people to, uh, you know, do a real estate investing or really, you know, and, and you have no real estate to even show them. Uh, that's, that's hard to do. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I could imagine. So, so, uh, yeah, I was proud of that. Good for you. Very cool. And then the last two here, I know you said now you're getting some more time to travel. Uh, do you have a favorite vacation or favorite destination? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, my the favorite place that we like to go to is a place in northern Scotland near Inverness, and um, uh, and it's just a great part of the world. It's one of the least populated parts of Europe, and it's uh, uh, it just kind of renews the soul to go out there. So yeah, I like that. You said that's in northern Scotland. Yeah, so it's north of Inverness. I've never been. I'll have to add that to the list. And uh, last and final, this is one I've always found interesting because you're such a busy guy. You've done a lot of amazing things. How much do you sleep at night? I sleep eight hours a night. Okay. Pretty much awesome. nonstop. <laughs> yeah. Very I mean, good. some people say they get by on six um, and, and I've never gotten by on. I can do six. I mean, I can do five, but I can't do it for a sustained period of so. time. Okay, great. Well, Chris, thank you. This has been so informative. You've given, uh, I think, everybody a lot to think about, hopefully some inspiration too for future business owners out there. So everybody definitely go check out his new book. It's called The Value Equation by Christopher Volk. Chris, any last words or parting advice that you'd like to leave with our listeners? Um, no, I, I, I think I think all any advice I've got is in the book, um, uh, but you're welcome to reach out. If you have any questions, find me, you go to the, the www.thevalueequation.com. Uh, there's a way to contact me there and I'm happy to uh, answer questions or uh, help in ways I can. Terrific. Well, thank you very much for your time. And everyone, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Kaderna podcast. I'm your host, Brian Kaderna. And today we've had the pleasure of listening to Christopher Volk. Again, go check out his new book, The Value Equation, and we will see you next time. This podcast is intended for the general public and for informational purposes only. The show does not provide any recommendations or investment advice regarding any specific account type, service, strategy, or product, or to otherwise act in any fiduciary or other capacity. Please contact a financial professional for guidance and information that is specific to your situation. Brian Kaderna does not provide tax or legal advice. Please contact your accountant or legal advisor to discuss your situation. Guest speakers and their firms are not affiliated with or endorsed by Park Avenue Securities, Guardian, or Kaderna Financial Team, and opinions stated are their own. All investments contain risk and may lose value. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. References to specific securities, asset classes, and financial markets are for illustrative purposes only and do not constitute a solicitation, offer, or recommendation to purchase or sell a security. Brian Kaderna is a registered representative and financial advisor of Park Avenue Securities, LLC, PAS, OSJ, 300 Broadacres Drive, Suite 175, Bloomfield, New Jersey, 07003. Phone number 973-244-4420. Securities products and advisory services offered through PAS, member FINRA, SIPC. Financial representative of the Guardian Life Insurance Company of America, Guardian, New York, New York. PAS is a wholly owned subsidiary of Guardian. Kaderna Financial Team is not an affiliate or subsidiary of PAS or Guardian. California Insurance License Number 0K04194.